The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled New Rules for Overcoming ITP, Guidance on Later Line Care, the Role of BTKI, and Improving Patient Outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash dbx865. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good evening, everybody. I hope you can hear me okay in the back. Uh, My name is David Cooter. I'm a classical hematologist, as we call ourselves now these days in Boston, and my Co-chairman here is Dr. Cindy Noonert, who is also a classical hematologist, maybe the, a fewer younger patients than I've got. So we're going to try to make oncologists into hematologists tonight, so bear with us if we can succeed. So our goals today are to review the pathophysiology and the issues in ITP. We're going to discuss current treatment algorithms for, for patients with ITP and provide a case-based insight on disease management for patients with this interesting disorder. And then we're going to switch in the last part of our discussion to new therapies in ITP. We'll briefly discuss the neonatal FC inhibitor data, which is out, compound inhibition, and we'll focus primarily on a drug class that many of you are familiar with, which are BTK inhibitors, and see whether they might provide us with a, a new role in approach to treating ITP patients. So let's start by talking about ITP. Let's talk about what it is clinically, all right? It's a a thing that's often dumped in the lap of of oncologists just because you're the only person in town who takes care of these diseases, and you have the hemonc name pended at your name. So let's talk about the clinical aspects of ITP. I'll start with a case. This is an old, rather old case. This is Robert Willen, who is a cherubic Yorkshireman who back in 1808 published a book called On Cutaneous Diseases. This is the copy I have in my office at home. And basically, he published a book and described a condition called purpura hemorrhagica, which obviously is the first English description of ITP, with ITP having been described back in the 18th century by others in other languages. And what he described were patients who had these interesting lesions, which I think you can all recognize as petechiae. He called these a purpura simplex. He then described larger lesions, which we now know to be ecchymoses or purpura, and he called these purpura hemorrhagica, hence the name of this disease. And then he gave us some insights, which are quite good in terms of what ITP actually is. And he says that purpura hemorrhagica occurs at every stage of life and chiefly affects persons of a weak and delicate habit. Now, don't hit me for this, okay? Women and boys appear to be most liable to it, In the latter, the hemorrhage usually takes place from the nose. He then went on in this lovely monograph to describe what causes ITP. He said a sedentary mode of life, poor diet, impure air, and anxiety of mind are the usual exciting causes of this disease. He said in the treatment of this disease, we should recommend moderate exercise in the open air, a generous diet, the free use of wine, Peruvian bark, and vitriolic acid. Without air, exercise, and an easy state of mind, the effect of medicines is very uncertain. And I think right now the major change to modern guidelines is we have medicines which are more effective, and although there are some uncertainties in in ITP, I think they are much less than this chap mentioned uh, many hundreds of years ago. So let's start with ITP in terms of a clinical diagnosis. The criteria for ITP is a platelet count under 100,000, with no other apparent cause of thrombocytopenia. We have primary disease, meaning there's no other secondary lesion that causes this, for example, CLL or collagen vascular diseases or other immune deficiencies. We talk about a staging system. We're learning from our oncology brethren. Newly diagnosed is the first three months. Persistent ITP is months three to 12, and chronic ITP is months after 12. Most patients do not require bone marrow biopsy. In general, we reserve a bone marrow biopsy for patients who are unresponsive to corticosteroid or IVIG therapy, and particularly for patients who have other nuances of abnormalities in their blood smear, such as abnormal precursors that may be present. The ITP is like other diseases. As you get older, guess what? It gets worse. So we have a higher frequency of ITP. This is all comers here in blue. There's also a higher incidence of ITP in younger children, ages 0 to 4, and it can happen any time of life. 
we can look at whether men or women are more, are more affected by it. And in general, the frequency in both genders is exactly the same. So in general, males and females both get ITP. And if you're treating older patients like I do, it's a pretty common finding for me to see ITP patients. And for Dr. Noonert, it's a very common consideration for pediatricians. Now, there are three aspects of ITP that I think we need to cover before we talk about clinical therapy. And the first is one you all know. If your plate count is low, guess what? There's a chance you might bleed. So bleeding is, is obviously the major concern of ITP. And to make a long story short, this is a rather bad data with very large confidence intervals here. But as you get older, your risk of having a fatal hemorrhage rises, whereas at lower ages, this has become much less. And non-fatal hemorrhages also occur at a greater frequency at age 60. And the question you should probably ask is, why do people with ITP not bleed that much with platelet counts of 12 or 15,000. You all have leukemic or chemotherapy patients with low platelet counts, and they tend to bleed and make your nursing staff go crazy with fear. It's because in ITP, the platelets are young, vigorous, and oftentimes large and hyperfunctional. So many ITP patients do totally fine with their platelet counts at 15 to 20,000 with minimal hysterical reasons to do anything ex exotic, admitted to the hospital, or give platelet transfusions in contradistinction to a chemotherapy patient with a platelet count of 12 or 13,000. And that's a pretty much a good general rule for patients. What's also important and less appreciated is, in addition to being a bleeding disorder, ITP is a prothrombotic disorder. And this is a lovely study I'll take you through. And this is a study done by our colleagues in London a number of years ago. They compared the rates of venous and arterial thromboembolism comparing primary ITP patients to, pr to patients who did not have primary ITP and had, did not have ITP at all. And what they showed quite nicely is a frequency of DVT was higher in ITP patients than in the controls. Pulmonary emboli were higher than in controls. And what's striking here is the rate of myocardial infarction was higher in ITP patients than con controls. And furthermore, unstable angina also with a greater frequency. A bit surprising is the thrombotic events in terms of strokes were pretty much the same. This is like other thrombocytopenic disorders like TTP and DIC with increased plated turnover, where the increased turnover, for other reasons we can talk about, may be prothrombotic. But what they also showed, which was quite interesting, is the rate of thrombosis rose as the plated count declined. And here are patients with sort of mild thrombocytopenia. And as it became more severe, the rate of thrombosis rose. And this is also true of DIC, TTP, and other thrombotic microangiopathies. So that's the second main point. ITP patients bleed. Second, they have a thrombotic risk. But thirdly, and, and probably less well appreciated, is the quality of life is decreased in ITP patients, probably more so than in arthritis or diabetic patients. And this is a uh, SF36 scale that was published a number of years ago by our colleague, Dr. Bussell. He showed that basically ITP patients in green have reduced physical function compared to arthritic and diabetic patients. The social function, probably because bruises aren't pretty to look at, were also decreased. And in general, the green bars are always much lower than patients who had diabetes or arthritis. So when you talk to your patients with ITP, Oftentimes, this doesn't come up in your conversation, but don't dismiss their complaints of fatigue. I just don't feel well. It's not all in their heads, and this is a common complaint in ITP patients that probably needs to be respected more than we've done in the past. So having said that, this is the clinical picture that many of us see for ITP patients. It's a little different in pediatric patients, and I won't comment upon that, but the other question comes is, why do we have ITP in the first place? What makes this disease occur? And let me give you a little bit more of a historical introduction here. This is my predecessor at our hospital. This is James Homer Wright. He invented the stain you all know called the Wright stain. This is his rather dour picture from 1906. He was the chief of pathology at our hospital. He had his research tool here, his microscope, and he did some interesting work. He was the first person to show that platelets came from a bone marrow cell called the megakaryocyte. And this is a camera lucid drawing from him. I have a copy of some office of a megakaryocyte giving forth some uh, processes that butt off platelets. And this is probably a good representation of what's happening to all of you right now. Your megakaryocytes are butting off platelets. And just going back to the general ITP gestalt, what happens in ITP 
is antibodies will pick off and destroy these platelets. But as I'll describe momentarily, antibodies and T cells also affect megakaryocyte growth and suppress megakaryocytes. And in general, what we need to think about of ITP, it's a problem of platelet destruction, but also inhibition of platelet production. And we get a better clue with the data for this to another ancient colleague of mine. This is George Minot, who, uh, whose office I once occupied after he retired and died a decade, decades before I became a physician. He got the Nobel Prize in 1932 for discovering B12, but his major work before that was studies of idiopathic purple hemorrhagica. And this is his publication from 1916. It's one case with almost 35 pages of, of description. And what is neat about this description is he said that ITP is some reaction, presumably a specific poison, taking place in the body which destroys platelets as fast as they're being formed. And then he says there is also a localized aplasia of the platelet-forming elements of the marrow, which might also be due to this toxic phenomenon. So this is a very prescient statement 100 years before we knew what was going on in ITP. And then we get to the real, real recent data, which is Dr. Harrington, who his picture is right here. He did a very interesting experiment. Some of you know he took plasma from ITP patients and injected it into himself. His platelet count dropped to life-threatening low levels. He uh, almost died of his CNS hemorrhage. His platelet count recovered. The other members of his lab were less affected by the thrombocytopenia. But he's the person who put on the map that ITP is a disorder of platelet destruction. He finally proved this. We now know it's antibodies in the ITP plasma that he received that caused this. So in general, uh, if you want to think about the destructive aspects of ITP, let me give you a model. And this is a beautiful electron micrograph of a mega... This is a macrophage. So macrophage, not megakaryocyte. This is a macrophage ingesting an antibody-coated platelet here, and here's another platelet that this macrophage has recently eaten. So this is the model you should have in your heads of how macrophages chew up antibody-coated platelets. I'm going to come back to what I'm going to show you next in a few more minutes, but the way to think about this is to make a cartoon model of what happens in ITP. So if we could create a macrophage here, and here are some platelets, if we could all of a sudden trigger ITP, an antibody against platelets appears. It then binds to the platelets, it binds to the platelets and gives you an antigen-antibody complex. An antigen-antibody complex is bind to FC gamma R3 receptors on macrophages like this. They activate a whole set of signal transduction pathways of SICK and BTK. The platelet gets destroyed by being internalized. And we'll come back to this model of platelet destruction a little later on in terms of how to intervene and prevent it, but this is the destructive par portion of ITP in general. There are a few nuances I didn't go over, but we can come to those later if people have questions. But ITP is also a disorder of suboptimal platelet production. And this is a study by one of our dear colleagues, Terry Gernsheimer, who, showed, who did platelet kinetic studies. She labeled platelets with technetium and other radioactive substances and injected them into normals. Here's a normal person with a platelet count that's normally at about 256,000. And then the survival is 9.6 days. And if you look at the normal rate of platelet production, the platelet production rate is 41 units per day. She then looked at ITP patients with platelet counts one-tenth of normal at 36,000. As expected, the platelet survival was reduced to 2.8 days. But she also showed that platelet production was reduced. And this was rather innovative at this time. We now know this to be true, that platelet production is in general reduced in ITP patients. And the other model you should have in your head, head is, is this. This is a study by one of our other colleagues, Dr. McMillan, who grew megakaryocytes in tissue culture. And so these are megakaryocytes growing. If you add to it plasma from 12 different patients, some plasma inhibits megakaryocytes maximally. Other plasma from the ITP patients suppresses megakaryocyte growth less well. In other studies which are done, antibodies against megakaryocytes pre prevent that platelet shedding I described to you in that old picture by Dr. Wright. So this is what's happening in ITP patients. And to make a cartoon model for you all, here's a megakaryocyte, the other M cell. This is now megakaryocyte, not macrophage. 
Here's a mega carry site, which is in the bone marrow of patients' ITP. Antibodies come along and bind to it. Lymphocytes can do the same. These create apoptosis of the mega carry site, and the platelet in the mega carry site dies and doesn't make platelets. So those mega carry sites, which are increased in ITP bone marrows, are, function, are not functioning as they ought to. They're not making platelets, and if you stain them appropriately, they're all apoptotic mega carry sites. So this leads to my final introductory slide about pathophysiology. This is a cartoon of me, okay? I used to have muscles. I used to be thin. And what you see here is I make platelets in my bone marrow. They enter my circulation, and after 7 to 10 days, a platelet clock says for the platelet to undergo apoptosis, and the platelets get destroyed by normal turnover. If I develop ITP, my spleen and possibly my liver res result in the platelets being destroyed, my platelet count drops a lot, and here's the increased rate of platelet destruction. It was thought for many decades that when this happened, the body increased the rate of platelet production, but this is not the case. What happens in ITP is the rate of platelet production may be, may be amplified or even reduced in ITP patients, and so we've got a real problem here. We've got patients with a high rate of platelet destruction and an inappropriately low rate of platelet production. And this leads to the major ways we treat ITP. We can either stimulate platelet production or we can decrease platelet destruction. And this is the guidance for all the current therapies, which we'll discuss momentarily. And basically, if I want to make a slide to illustrate this, the therapies that increase platelet production, you all know these, are the thrombopotent receptor agonists. And I should also mention that the major feature of corticosteroids is it increases platelet production, which is one of its major mechanisms in terms of how it works in treating ITP patients. What's in black here are three other mechanisms in terms of reducing platelet destruction, and they can reduce IgG, for example, by rituximab. You can block FC receptors on macrophages, for example, by the drug fostamatinib or by dapsone or danazol. Or you can remove the site of platelet clearance which creates the disease asplenia by doing a splenectomy, or as they do commonly in Japan, doing splenic embolization. But these are the, this is the current tool chest we have for treating ITP. So did I make that go okay, Cindy? Yeah. I think there's still a lot we don't know. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot we're trying to learn about why every individual patient is different and how can we actually clinically apply what we know about these differences in pathophysiology. So I have a question for Dr. Nooner, which is, you know, if you're a clinician taking care of ITP patients, how do you know whether your patient's destroying too much or not making enough? <laughs> so I wish we had that answer. Um, you know, there is a little bit of looking at your kind of your IPF, using that a little bit like what you is, would. What is IPF? So the immature platelet fraction and using that a little bit like you would a reticulocyte count in an anemia patient to see if you have kind of this nice compensatory um, appropriate response in the immature platelet fraction. But again, I've also seen clinically that you know, I have variability in that as well. Um, so we don't really have a lot of good tests yet for distinguishing these patients. It would be really nice to have a series or a panel of tests that we could send out to know exactly which patients would respond best to which therapies um, is what we really want to know. Why don't we move on to the yeah. next session here? So now we're going to do a little bit of some clinical consults, and uh, this part of the session will be a little bit interactive. We'll kind of present some cases and then have a little bit of discussion back and forth about the nuances of these treatment algorithms. So we'll start with a case. Um, this is a 26-year-old female. She notices heavy menses for about three months, and then for about the past three days has developed some petechiae and bruises and comes into the office. No recent infections, nothing in terms of medications or exposures, no other medical history. On physical exam, she has no lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly. She's got moderate petechiae and bruises and two small oral blisters. And we get her labs back and we see an isolated thrombocytopenia with a platelet count of 4,000. And we look under the microscope with normal red cell and white cell morphology and we identify some large platelets. So this is a patient with newly diagnosed ITP presenting to our office. Platelet count is 4,000. At this time, her symptomatology is mostly skin findings in terms of what we see today. But on history, she definitely is having some heavy menses and as well has two small buccal mucosal lesions, which some people would suggest as an indicator for somebody with a more significant bleeding phenotype. 
In terms of a treatment paradigm, you know, our goal is really to provide hemostasis. It's not to provide a normal platelet count. So what we're really trying to do is minimize treatment mortality and morbidity, but increase the platelet count to a number that gets us our desirable effect of reducing our bleeding symptoms. And this can be achieved by getting even just as high as taking her from four to say 22. You know, we don't need to go all the way to 150 to consider things to be successful in the acute management. I think there's a little bit of variability in terms of what the actual threshold is that we need for treatment. I think everybody would agree that over a platelet count of anywhere from 30 to 50,000, treatment is rarely required unless the patient has um, some upcoming procedure or significant bleeding event that is characteristically out of proportion to the platelet count. Most guidelines would suggest that a platelet count less than 20 or 30,000 should receive treatment, and that upfront treatment is usually with a, short, with a course of corticosteroids, trying to minimize the duration to less than six weeks. In patients who have a contraindication to corticosteroids or who need a more rapid response in the platelet count, we can use anti-D immunoglobulin or IVIG. And then shown here are the two reports from the um, guidelines that are out there, the American Society of Hematology guidelines from 2019, suggesting that in those patients with a platelet count less than 30,000, we would provide management with corticosteroids. And then less than 20,000, we would also admit to the hospital. There was an international consensus report that basically said about the same thing, that treatment should really be targeted at maintaining a platelet count between 20 and 30,000 for at least symptomatic patients, and corticosteroids remain the standard first-line therapy. So in terms of our patient, we would get her started on some corticosteroids. So I just have some questions for Dr. Cooter in terms of does he agree with the treatment algorithm. When can we consider observation for someone? Would it ever be appropriate at a platelet count threshold to consider observation? There's some discussion about the corticosteroids in terms of whether or not we use prednisone or dexamethasone. And then again, the question of IVIG and anti-D. So we'll just start with a basic discussion about the algorithm shown here and perhaps the role of observation in patients. Well, again, I think right now many patients who are not bleeding and have platelet counts over, in my mind, 20,000 can be observed. They are observed closely. I have patients who we have observed for 30 or 40 years with plate accounts of 22,000 or 18,000. He's a person on our staff at our hospital, and I've, I see him in the hallways every day, so I guess that's close observation. But he's done well with no trouble, so whenever he needs a procedure like a prostate biopsy, we give him some corticosteroids or occasionally IVIG his counts up and treat him. So I think the first question is who needs to be treated? And I think right now, as we've gone further and further down the line in terms of ITP, we've dropped our plated threshold, I think, a lot in terms of who we're going to treat. So I think in general, if someone's not bleeding and they're a stable and a rational person and not a bungee jumper or play rugby, I would certainly tolerate plated down to 20,000 before recommending any chronic therapy. Obviously, that patient tells me that they're having periods that last for five weeks. You know, that changes the story. So bleeding colors this, as does the age of the patient and their activity level. Yeah, and I I think it's really important to highlight that that when working on the guidelines or when reading the consensus document, there's always statements and then there's a lot of paragraphs that follow those statements. And there is a lot of consideration given to exactly those things. That we don't know the lower age limit at which perhaps patients should be, you know, observed versus in elderly patients or patients with more of risk for bleeding. We don't know exactly within this window of 20 to 30 where the right threshold lies, and I think it has come down over time in terms of what people are comfortable with in terms of observation. Um, And then again, consideration of the patient themselves. How far away do they live from a medical center? What else might be going on in their lives? Are they, as you said, in my world, it's a lot of, you know, high school boys that want to go off and get college football scholarships that uh, push our treatment and management. So there's always a lot of personal drive to this. So I think that the next question is, though, what do we use for treatment? Um, You know, we have two different strategies. We've got prednisone courses with a taper, and then we've got bursts of four days of dexamethasone given periodically. Um, So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on which is sort of the best upfront strategy between the two. Well, you you and I know that there there are meta-analyses comparing dexamethasone or prednisone as treatment of choice. And I think right now my problems with high-dose dexamethasone is that even though it may work a bit faster than prednisone at 60 milligrams a day, there are a lot of older patients who go crazy on this. And I've got a patient who's given 20 milligrams of prednisone, 
is out in the streets in the wintertime naked yelling for his wife. So I think right now you've got to be careful with high-dose Prevodex and other sun some patients. You've probably treated myeloma patients with my high-dose Dex. So it's the same issues there. I also think right now that the initial trials with high-dose Dex and methods are done in Hong Kong showed that people went into remission. We now know that's probably not the case. So I think that there is no long-term benefit from, from high-dose Dex and methadone as we once thought. So I, I'm a prednisone guy, and I will start almost everybody on 60 milligrams of prednisone. And the key is to get them off the damn corticosteroids. It's not so much what you start with. It's where you end and how, long, how much later. So I'd toss the question back to you. So how long, <laughs> how long, do, how long would you tolerate steroids in a patient before calling it quits? Yeah, I mean, I, so... You know, the pediatrician in me, we do much shorter courses of corticosteroids, and I, and I love to always give the adults a hard time for how long patients end up on corticosteroids. But, you know, I think there is a shift in terms of um, recognizing pretty quickly that um, patients shouldn't languish on steroids. And, and patients will tell you how miserable it is. There was a really nice um, kind of study done by Jim George's group uh, out of Oklahoma, and they asked patients what they were worried about, and the patients were really worried about the side effects of their steroids while the doctors were worried about their bleeding. So there was a complete disconnect in what the patients were concerned about, which is wanting to get off steroids, wanting to not feel the way they did, wanting to have a good night's sleep, um, all these side effects. Um, So I think we do need to recognize um, that form of toxicity with long-term steroids. And I think what you said really speaks to the, you know, the guidelines do across the board support that there's no evidence that one form of steroids is better than the other, and that really the goal is to, to get patients off them quite quickly and start to think about what you're going to do next. So what is quickly? <laughs> well, in my world, it's about a week, <laughs> okay. but I know, yeah. I know so, for you, yeah. for, you know, in the adult world, le- about yeah. less than six weeks, you know, start. But if somebody's not responding within, you know, I, I would say within a week or two, you, you need to start moving there's no reason to think that you're going to get more effect the longer they're on. So, so if they're not showing you an effect up front, then it's time to switch to something else. But at, at maximum, you know, you want to be off those steroids within six weeks. And I think right now this also comes to the fact that a lot of these patients initially diagnosed are in your hospital and your administrators want to get them out of the hospital fast. So our usual approach is to use, a high, use corticosteroids of some type to get their counts to over 10,000 for about 12 hours before the case manager kicks them out of the hospital, but we then follow them closely as an outpatient. But I think right now, if there's no response in, in two weeks, I would rapidly transition other forms of therapy. And after, if after six weeks of tapering the steroids, you're now back to where you started from, then at, it's at that point you think about other agents. You should not be keeping these patients on cortical steroids forever. It's, it's, and I, I'll, make, I'll make that statement. I'm going to take it back a tiny bit, if you don't mind. I have a couple of patients who, who do great on 2.5 milligrams of prednisone a day, but on it for years, and every time I stop it, they crash. So I will say that I will want to keep my no more than 5 milligrams. If that, if that works, I would probably say that's probably tolerable. Yeah, I, 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 I become a rheumatologist in that regard. <laughs> I have a couple that I leave on a whiff of steroids in the background of something else, and it seems to make the something else work. But, uh, but I, and I, you know, I think this is a change in our in our treatment paradigm because we have now agents to go to. Right? We used to just have steroids, and then you were looking at splenectomy, which seemed rather daunting. So why not keep trying? But now that we have these newer agents that we'll talk about, I think that's changed. And then for me, the IVIG and anti-D truly is contraindication to steroids or that patient that comes in that really needs that more rapid 24-hour response, you know, that you don't want to wait for the, for the steroids. What, what about plated transfusions in a patient who comes in with bleeding? Do you give plated transfusions? I do. I do. I have yeah. used platelet transfusions, um, you know, in a severely... Um, pretty significant hemorrhage, life-threatening type Hmm. situation. I typically will give a bolus, and then I actually run them in as a continuous infusion. And then you've got all the other good stuff going in the background at the same time. Oftentimes, the the intern and residents in the emergency have done it before you've had a chance to. I tend to try to avoid that happening in patients who are not having severe life-threatening bleeding. No, only in the setting of life-threatening bleeding. Yep. Uh, Another thing that pops up when the algorithm, the first question, algorithm, why don't we become more aggressive like our oncologists and use more drugs up front? I mean, why don't we just add rituxan up front or do something else? Yeah, so there really, you know, there's been studies looking at that, um, and they have not shown in large, robust data sets that there's any change in long-term outcomes by trying to be more aggressive up front. People have also added in the thrombopoietin receptor agonists right up front. Um, and, I, and I think this is an area people have added in MMF up front. 
Um, so I think this is actually a growing body of, of research that's going to come out to say, what can we do up front to try to get better results um, in the end? All right, so we're going to switch. Okay, so now, now we're going to move into my world a little bit. And this is what I always say is so interesting. So sometimes 18-year-olds get referred to me, and they get off on the seventh floor of the clinic. Other times they get referred to adults, and they get off on the 10th floor of the clinic. And depending, they might get very different treatment. But we'll take a 15-year-old, bruises and petechiae for three days, same story. Um, platelet count is 4,000. Her diagnosis is ITP. So does the age of the patient change anything? For her being 15, likely not. We tend to think that probably 10 and above, we start to act a little bit more like an adult with ITP. But you can see here that we have very different features of adults and children with ITP. And this is why our management is somewhat different. Um, so you can see that children are very unlikely to develop chronic disease compared to adults. They have much lower rates of intracranial hemorrhage, although they do have rates of spontaneous bleeding. Their presenting platelet count is often quite low. In children, the common classic story is that one day they were fine, they went to school, and they got sent home. They're also about the same as adults in terms of a treatment response, but what seems to be different is that in children, we can do a short course of corticosteroids for five to seven days, take them off, they get better. And in adults, they need the longer taper, and oftentimes a lot of them will relapse or not respond. So I do think these are two different conditions. We don't quite understand um, the, the reasoning for this, um, but I think there's studies looking at the, there's a large study that's getting biobank data and genetic data looking at both pediatric and adult cohorts to see how we can compare them and what we can learn. And there is this crosstalk in the adolescent and AYA population where I think we need to be mindful of when should we start switching our practice um, to treat an adolescent more like an adult. So back to uh, our case, we get admitted to the hospital for a diagnosis of ITP and heavy menses, platelet count less than 20, so consistent with what our guidelines would suggest we should do. She does get started on prednisone. Her blood blisters and her petechiae start to resolve and her platelet count starts to come up and she gets discharged to home. An interesting thing about steroids is that they also seem to probably stabilize the vascular endothelium and close our gap junctions and we do get resolution of bleeding symptoms even before our platelet count comes up. She comes back to our office 10 days later, and her platelet count is 175,000, and we kind of begin to do her taper. So what should we have done? We touched on this a little bit. What, what should we have done if her platelet count wasn't good when she came back to our office? What should we have done if her platelet count continued to be low? And I'll pose this question, and we kind of touched on the, the early introduction of moving forward. Well, again, I think right now when people fail corticosteroids or the disease progresses and we don't want to keep them on corticosteroids, the next step on the bus is to add, add another agent. And I think right now the current guidelines suggest to consider between rituximab or between a TP receptor agonist. And at this point, I would consider in this patient uh, those two options. I think there's a preference in our hands to use a TPR agonist because I think they're a bit easier, uh, have a higher response rate than rituximab does, there has been until recently concerns about rituximab in terms of making you not vaccinatable with the COVID epidemic, but I think those days are hopefully passing. So I have, a, I have an increasing appreciation of using rituximab in this patient population, even though the long-term benefit of rituximab is it rarely cures people, the ITP. But in young women, as you well know, there is a little bit of data saying that rituximab has a higher long-term remission rate than it would in the general population with some other agent being used. And, you know, we have these timelines. You kind of put them up there, right? You know, three months, we're now persistent. Twelve months, we're chronic. And I, I feel as though that might be doing a disservice to patients because then drugs get approved or um, the notion is, oh, I have to wait three months. I can't use this until my patient has persistent ITP or until this is a chronic therapy. And I think that for those of us in clinical practice, we kind of throw those timelines out the window when you have a patient sitting in front of you, whether they're a month in or, or a week in, you're, you're constantly making these same decisions really with time not being part of the equation. So I think it's important to not just feel as though you're locked into having to wait until you meet a particular time point um, to get a patient a medicine that they might benefit from. So I don't know what your thoughts are yeah, on I that. I think but... you know, problems, the problem is that labels for some medications say chronic ITP. And when, yeah. for example, remipolstim end plate was approved back in uh, 2008, it was for chronic ITP. But in those days, chronic ITP was at six months, whereas now it's 12 months. Yeah. 
And I think that these definitions, which need to be changed and are being changed by our colleagues, are going to go out the window soon, and we're going to probably not even use the words uh, chronic anymore in terms of talking about IT. We're talking about people who are multiply resistant to various to numbers of therapies. So I think these don't do us a service as saying, hey, they're not yet chronic. They haven't had disease for a year. We can't use age. That's all nonsense. I, I think right now that the, what's, what is nonsense is keeping a patient on cortical steroids for 11 and a half months to, to avoid, since you can't think you, you think you can't give another agent. That just is, I think, practice, which is aside from current guidelines. I would agree. So back to our case. On weeks two through five, her prednisone is slowly weaned down to 20 milligrams a day. Her platelet count is 55,000. She currently is on, by week six, down to 15. But her platelet count goes down. It goes down to 14, and her menses become heavy again. She's gaining weight. She's feeling fatigued. She's having difficulty sleeping. All these things that the patients express are very distressing to them about staying on corticosteroids. She really expresses a desire to come off steroids, and she'd like to minimize medication side effects, which have been her primary concern. So here we have a patient who is expressing goals of avoiding side effects of medications and coming off corticosteroids. What about our other case? So our other case, six months later, was treated for heavy menses, failed after two short courses of corticosteroids, IVIG. She's a mildly elevated ANA, 1 to 160. She has some nosebleeds, heavy menses. She's really limiting her social interactions and her summer plans, and this is very disruptive to her. The steroids disturb her sleep. They make her irritable. She has terrible headaches following IVIG, which she's needed a couple times for heavy menstrual bleeding. She's anxious about her ITP. She becomes tearful. She's looking for a treatment that will, quote, cure her. She does not want to take medication on an ongoing basis. She wants to go back to her old way of life and frequent social activities without having to worry about either bleeding or treatment side effects. So now we have a slightly different patient profile. This is a patient that really wants her ITP to not be part of her life anymore. She's really looking for something that would make it almost go away. So expressing slightly different goals. So we'll talk through our options for second-line management. These include just resuming low-dose corticosteroids, thrombopoietin receptor agonists, rituximab, fostimatinib, and splenectomy. And we already had sort of a nice overview of how these different drugs work in general terms. So in terms of our thrombopoietin receptor agonists, these activate that TPO receptor on megakaryocytes, increase our platelet production. There's three that are currently available. They really vary just in administration and then in what you need to watch for in terms of our thrombopag with some dietary interactions. The major side effects are thrombosis and liver enzyme elevation, which is specific to L-thrombopag. Rituximab, this drug works by reducing our CD20 B cells. This is a therapy you all know just as well as us in terms of oncology usage. I think one of the things we struggle with is that we dose it the same way it's dosed in oncology, which is probably too much for what we're trying to do, right? Um, I don't know that more is better when it comes to rituximab, and there are some lower dose protocols that are out there. Major side effects, again, things you're all familiar with in terms of infusion reactions, the immunosuppression. But there is this notion of persistent hypogammaglobulinemia, maybe panned out a little bit more in the pediatric and adolescent population, but a group of patients that don't really reconstitute their normal immunoglobulins following use. Fostimatinib, this is our sick inhibitor. It really prevents the conformational change that macrophage needs to do to um, engulf that antibody-coated platelet. It is a daily oral medication, and the major side effects are hypertension and GI side effects, and these actually can be quite limiting for patients. This is really one of the bigger limitations in the drug itself, and a lot of patients in the clinical trials had to temporarily come off the drug for these reasons. And then splenectomy, as we talked about, we're simply just removing the source of platelet destruction. And the major side effect is a lifelong risk of infection and possibly a risk of um, thrombosis as well. Here's the 2019 ASH guidelines. And what we ended up with was not really a nice, clear set of guidelines, but more of a diagram because we realized, again, patients don't fall into nice buckets. We kind of were trying to make a guideline for patients that were corticosteroid resistant and had ITP for greater than three months. And we started to realize in putting these things side by side in a dichotomous fashion that that's not really the way it works in clinical practice. So what you see here are a lot of the other things that should be taken into account in terms of patient goals, patients' desires, 
how long they've had ITP, and what they're really struggling with, which might then help you start to tease out the right therapy. So we'll just pause there in terms of opening up a discussion about what the important patient characteristics are to consider with second-line therapies. What are our curative therapies? Does such a thing even exist? Um, and what's the modern-day role for splenectomy? And these were some of the questions that have even already come in for this session. So I think everybody's already thinking these same things about these difficult patients that can be really challenging when we start to think about second-line agents. For me, in these two cases, I think they really do highlight important patient characteristics. I always start out the discussion of second-line therapy almost as a goal-setting session, um, just kind of trying to understand what life looks like living with ITP for the patient, what their goals are. Some patients are really clear in what it is that bothers them the most. I had a poor young man that came to me after being on steroids for months and he never wanted to take an oral medication again because he equated it with side effects. Um, that was just where he was with ITP. So every patient is going to have a different journey, a different story, and I think that's really important to consider. In our one case, we threw in the positive ANA of 1 to 160, you know, young female positive ANA. Some might think that, in a, that that's a good candidate for rituximab when we think about biologic characteristics of the disease. Um, so that's sort of my approach in, in talking with patients about how to engage them and what therapy we can kind of come up with that might be best for them. Yeah, I think the interaction with the patients, when you initially meet a patient ITP, they are scared to death, they're going to bleed to death into their brain. They're, they've heard about this, and the emergency room doctors have reinforced that fear. We come along and try to encourage them that that's not probably going to happen to them, that they still have to be treated. They trust us to give them corticosteroids or occasionally IVIG, and we're in the driving seat, driver's seat at that time. But when they've had ITP for more than two or three weeks, they've done all their Google searches. They've talked to way too many people. And they now recognize that steroids isn't the cup of tea <laughs> that we initially thought it was. And so at this point, the discussion is in large measure a two-way discussion with them being more educated, hopefully, in terms of how to uh, deal with this condition. And I think right now there are several things I tell patients. One is I reset or recalibrate their goals for what a safe plate account is. So I'd say, hey... You're over 20,000 right now, and they're big platelets. I take them to the microscope and show them their, micro, their platelets on the microscope and say, hey, this is good. You're going to be fine. So I recalibrate what, is, what success is. And number two, I make a goal to get them off steroids as fast as I possibly can. And number three, we discuss, discuss other options. And in terms of the, of the big option in the room, which is do I need my spleen taken out, I think the data is pretty good that says in adults, if you can medically support them for a year, there's at least a 33% chance they will go into remission, a complete remission, if you just avoid doing a surgical procedure. So I say my goal in the next you know, 11 and a half months with you is to keep your plate account in a safe range. Then we discuss options. And I think for most people, uh, a TPRA receptor agonist is probably the easiest medication to give. There are a few people who say, hey, uh, you know, I, I travel, my salesman, I travel every couple of weeks. I I, or I run, a, I run a restaurant, I can't abide by the El Trombo Peg <laughs> dietary restrictions. I think right now those are the patients I will in sometimes use rituximab. And I'm increasingly going back to rituximab as a therapy since I think it, it, it pulls your butt out of the fire, so to speak, for about a year, but it doesn't give you a prolonged remission. But I think the main message here, avoid surgical interventions at least for a year until you can, if you can, to give them a chance to have remission. And that is common in adult patients more so in your patients than mine. Yeah, I mean, we, we yeah. really do try to avoid it. But I, I, I mm. think 100% there's a message out there that splenectomy really should be after 12 months of disease. And, and maybe even further, if you've got a patient that's doing well on the therapy that they're on, you know, obviously there's times when, again, life-threatening, urgent situations, that is what you're going to have to do. But we really try to avoid it for 12 months. And I think that, um, that that really is the modern day role, per se, um, is to try to avoid it. We did have a question that came in kind of related to this in terms of for a patient showing suboptimal but not poor response to a second line agent after weaning off steroids, how do you decide between maintaining versus switching? And I think this speaks beautifully to the point of it really comes down to, is that platelet count sufficient to allow that patient to achieve the goals of why they went on therapy in the first place? Um, so if the platelet count is high enough, um, it's just like what we said in the beginning. We don't need a normal platelet count. If we can achieve the lowest dose of medicine needed to give us a platelet count that achieves our, our treatment goals and the reason for going on treatment in the first place, 
then I think that's a win um, and there's no reason to switch. I do think it is important though, as we put patients on these therapies to do check-ins, right? Um, to just make sure that it still makes sense, to just make sure that there isn't something we're not talking about, something new that's out, something that might better fit for the patient based on a change in lifestyle or how things are going for them. In terms of curative therapies, you know, I, if you talk to patients, actually, patients tell you they never feel like their ITP is cured. We talked with some patients who told us they don't actually believe in the word remission. They just believe it's a waiting game until the ITP comes back. Even patients who have had a normal platelet count for a while. So it's very interesting. But I don't, you know, nothing is curative. Um, I guess splenectomy is the closest we get, but you're still making the antibodies. But, 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 <laughs> but splenectomy is not curative in the sense it, you right. create a different disease it, yeah, that yes. has its own ramifications. <laughs> so, you know, as much as people say, well, I've been splenectomized, I'm cured. Well, you may be cured of one problem, then you get another problem in face of you. There are you complications with splenectomy. <laughs> and to be honest, I'll, I'll be a little hard ass here, and I'll hopefully stir up the audience a little bit here. You know, I almost never recommend splenectomy, and I just say yeah. that almost every patient I can treat without having a need to resort to that. The exceptions have been military air pilots or people in active yeah. service who say, I can't go back on the front lines unless I have this done. And ironically, you take their spleens out and you know, they maybe have a 50% chance of long-term remission. But I just worry about that soldier in the field then getting infection and having an asplenic state. So yeah. I just, I'd be just honest with you, I, I rarely recommend uh, splenectomy as patients. What, there's a question which I think was pretty interesting that, yeah. that we may be held at fault for not including in our recommendations, also in our guidelines for that matter, which is the questioner asks, what about azathioprine? What, I, what about immunosuppressive yeah. drugs as second line therapy for these patients? If you were in Britain... And there are places. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we, when we worked on the guidelines, we really struggled with this, right? The, the most attention is given to the drugs that we have here but there are widely used other drugs and you put them all up on your slide as well. I mean, the list is very long of therapies that have been used. Um, you know, azathioprine, I think its biggest role remains be it, that it's safe in pregnant women. Um, outside of that, I, I don't fall to it too often. You know, there is data in similar classes in terms of MMF, 6MP, sort of the same kind of target. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of different drugs that get used. I think um, it's not uncommon in other countries. And Adapzone is widely used. Adapzone is widely used. <laughs> so it's widely used. It creates a little, little bit of red cell hemolysis that blocks the RE system. All of these have response rates of 30 to 40 percent. And, and you did me a great favor by sticking me in the guidelines committee of doing all these alternative therapies. So I, <laughs> I spent like three months looking at this stuff. And basically, you know, there's a, you know, a, a 30 percent response rate with Vin Christine, a 45 percent response rate with Michael Fenlate. If you're a dog, 100% response rate to azathioprine, by the way. It works great in dogs. So if you're a beta veterinarian, you're by all means use azathioprine. But these things shouldn't be forgotten about, but they don't have the highest response rates as the newer agents do. And I think right now, uh, we at times might want to do studies comparing the old yeah. agents to see if they work. I think that would be beneficial to the whole field. Yeah. But I think we've gone past that because unfortunately there's no pharmaceutical company going to fund these studies. So... Little known fact, my dog had ITP and got azathioprine. And Dr. Gernsheimer's dog also got azathioprine. <laughs> it's the got, curse of being the dog of a hematologist. <laughs> so um, there was another question that came in. When is splenectomy recommended in pediatric ITP? I have not done a splenectomy um, in years in pediatrics. We really do try to avoid it because when you talk about lifelong risk, that's a very daunting risk to a five- or six-year-old child. Um, I really, I have patients that come to me because they've been referred to the surgeon at my center from another hematologist outside of my center for splenectomy, and he knows now to send them to me um, because we really just, we really just avoid it. I, I think there's much better things out there now to try. Again, I have done it in the setting of an emergent bleed that really that's just what was required. So it's not that it, you should say, oh, we never do it anymore, but just be very, very thoughtful about the patients you're selecting for it. We'll get to some of these others. The decision to start romiplastin for a patient with chronic ITP, I think we've touched on that a little bit. When you start to think about the different TPORAs, it really, for a lot of patients, is a lifestyle decision. For some, it's a financial out-of-pocket decision. Um, I, they're all very equal in efficacy, and I have found that there are patients that don't respond to one. I switch them, and, and for some reason, probably I think maybe the switch just targeted a little bit of adherence that was an issue on sometimes. But 
But really, I think a lot of it comes down to what the patient preference is between them. I, I, you know, yeah. more, more important it comes down to what the insurance company co- uh, yeah, covers. Yeah, That's the usual. The out of pocket. As you guys a lot of it well is the out of pocket so, yeah. for the families. Um, but, uh, you know, and for me, I'm able to get you know Ramaphosa for patients at home, so I don't have an issue yeah. with home administration. But you know, not every patient has that ability. But there are also issues of monitoring patients on TPRA, which I think come apparent to your staff, which is you know how often you need to check a plate count. And to be honest, if someone's got a stable plate count. We'll check their we'll check their plate count once every two or three months in a stable patient, and we'll also check that they have cause, meaning they have more bruising. But there's no need to check a plate count every visit, for example, for end plate or to have frequent plate counts in a stable patient on these other agents. I think that the good thing about these agents is, for most patients, they provide a reasonable amount of stability. And here's where you're going to catch me a bit if you ask me what stable means, because a stable patient is someone who's you know, on, for example, on remipalstim. The lowest plate counts above 50,000. Their highest plate count may be 400,000. There's a lot of fluctuations in these patients on these drugs. So I accept a wide range. And the other thing that I'll say that when you use a TPRA a lot is there's this, this emotive thing about, oh, God, the plate count's 401,000. i got to stop the drug. Well, that's the last thing you want to do because the package insert says that. That was created back in 2008 by mistaken regulators. And if you stop the drug the next week, the plate count may be down to 2,000. So if you think the counts are too high in the patient who's rather unstable, I would decrease the dose but not stop it in a patient whose, whose counts are too high. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're going to keep going. So after discussion, our patient decides to treat to start with a thrombopag. This was our female who wanted something. Minimal side effects was not... Um, averse to being on something daily. And you can see here, she's able to wean off her corticosteroids. Her platelet count remains 26,000. Her bleeding is improved at this point. um, And this is where she is now at week 52. So how do we proceed with this patient? Here we are, we're 26,000. Bleeding is better. She's not having any side effects. She's able to tolerate the dietary changes with a thrombopag. Have we done good enough? Uh, so I'll, I'll pose that to you. Have we done yeah. good enough for her? Well, so, you know, if, there's, if things are going well and the patient is feeling well and is in, in a non-risk category for bleeding, I would say that we don't have, to do, don't have to do more. If the question is, could you do better, that is always an interesting discussion. And oftentimes switching from one TPRA to the next, you get, a, a, as you mentioned, a response. And switching studies have been done and published on many different, uh, many different situations. We're going from l to remipalstim and vice versa, or to abitrombopeg. Many patients will then have a, a, a different response than they would to their initial TPRs. So in a patient like this, we'd have a long discussion about, are you fine on this? Is everything going okay? And if things are fine, I'd say, well, let's kick the can down the road a couple more months or a couple more years and see what happens. I certainly would not at this point in a patient like this recommend splenectomy. Yeah, I definitely. think that the issues that come out in a young patient, well, if she says, I want to get pregnant in two years, there are a lot of other nuances <laughs> here that, that come up in these patients. But I think right now, the, the, I would probably not change this dose. But if I was going to make any change, I would probably say, let's switch to a different TPRI and see if that works. And I would agree that that's usually my first strategy with the TPOs is to kind of move the three around and figure out which one is going to give them what they need. So I completely agree. But now she throws us a curveball. She asks about open clinical trials and what drugs might be available in the future for someone like her. Do we have anything? Yes, we do. I'm <laughs> glad you raised news. that point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I think she sets yeah. you up for the next phase yeah. of our discussion. Well, I wish more patients would consider clinical trials since most patients at this stage will say, I'm doing fine, let's not rock the boat, doc. And then the, another issue becomes, if I want to become pregnant, what do I do? And maybe we can discuss those nuances a little later on. Um, I would simply add to this patient, you know, the other option she has in terms of a modest response to a TPRA, one that's okay but not great, if you add a baby dose of prednisone, 2.5 or 5 milligrams, you oftentimes have huge synergy with low doses of corticosteroids. That's option A. Option B was to give her a, a, put her on mycophenolate or some other immunosuppressive drug and see if that gives you more mileage. So are there other options one could exercise in this kind of patient? But given the key that you know she's interested in clinical trials, let's go on to new new agents and ITPs. And this is a really hot area of an investigation, both for ITP and other autoimmune conditions. There's a plethora of, of interesting new drugs in the pipeline. So 
let's talk about novel therapies in ITP. And I wish I could spend the next four hours, you're not going to want me to do that, but the next four hours talking about novel therapies in ITP. I will mention neonatal FC inhibitors that are being studied. I'll mention comp inhibition. But I'll discuss a, a, an area of, of drugs which many of you are familiar with, which, which is a Bruton kinase inhibitor, and see if they might be an option for us going forward in the future. We're going to talk about an interesting area of medicine, which the heme community is using a lot more of your drugs than you realize in terms of treating autoimmune conditions. So let's go to the next slide here. So I'm going to go back to this cartoon I showed you before. This is my favorite uh, cartoon of, of platelets, and I said that antibodies get made. And so the first question in terms of a, a thought experiment or a Gedanken experiment is whether you could make the antibodies against your platelets disappear. So the question is, can we just make these disappear? In prior decades, plasmapheresis worked in ITP, but you couldn't keep doing it. So I'll simply say right now, there's a huge industry of therapies. In red are those we currently do, and in black are things that are in a pipeline. I wish I could talk about each of them, but splenectomy and corticosteroids and rituximab will obviously decrease antibody or anti plate antibody production. Uh, the drugs daratumumab is under clinical de development right now. You hear more about this from Walid Ganima at ASH in, in December. The anti-CD40 molecules have been sort of ho-hum in this area, haven't been very striking. Uh, bortezomib, which is one of the immunoproteasome inhibitors that you all know from myeloma, works quite well in ITP, and our studies are underway here. Uh, there are new molecules called B-cell activating factor receptor inhibitors, also drugs against April, if you know the whole pathway here, that target the immune system to turn it off. And finally, there are these lovely new molecules called neonatal FC inhibitors. One is IVIG, and the other has got, these are great Lord of the Rings names, Fgar Tigamod and Rosanzolizixamab. These are molecules which actually give you medical plasmapheresis, and one of them, Fgar Tigamod, is now FDA approved for myasthenia gravis. These are drugs that just make the antibody in your circulation disappear, drop your IgG level by about 60%, and have been shown to be effective in some patients with ITP. Well, if you've got antibodies around and you can't make them disappear, what next happens? What next happens is antibodies bind to platelets and create an antigen antibody complex that again, that's decorated with complement. And then these get carted off to your liver where C3B receptors, well, C3B receptors will cleave them, will cleave these particles and take them out of your circulation. So the question then comes, well, if complement plays a role, and we're not certain how much of a role complement plays, just to be very forthright here, it, there's data to show that complement's important in ITP. There's clinical data that's been recently published that suggests that inhibition may play a role here, but we're not quite certain about this. There's a little bit quirky data here, but there are a whole bunch of complement inhibitors. We have a purified C1 esterase that's been commercially available for a number of years. We have the new drug sutimumab, which we helped develop, which is an IgG antibody blocking a C1S. We have uh, iptocopan and danicopan, which is a new complement factor of B and D drugs for those you might be treating PNH patients. But these are all being studied in ITP. And there is a, a recent publication from three weeks ago by Dr. Broom and our group that actually looks at this molecule in ITP. So if you can't make the complement activity disappear, what happens next? Well, what happens next is this. The antigen antibody complex binds to the FC gamma R3 receptor. And so you've got to ask, well, can you inhibit this here with any drugs? And I will simply say in a few minutes that IVIG does block this a bit, as do other things that turn off your macrophages. But if you can't block the binding here, then what happens? You activate the sick kinase pathway, BTK pathway, and you then destroy platelets, and the ITP occurs. These are processes which current drug development has been targeting to try to make ITP get better, and as well as other macrophage-related disorders. So the list is rather long. Things that inhibit macrophage function are shown here. There are corticosteroids. We all know of vincristine and vinblastine, which, by the way, in extremis, you ought to think about these drugs. Splenectomy takes out a major site of macrophage destruction. IVIG blocks macrophages. I don't have the time, time to talk about it, but it's only a small component of IVIG, which is highly silated, that actually is active here, and you can now convert the whole batch of IVIG to silated IVIG with a super IVIG product. It's also important to note that the FC portion of IVIG is the only part that's necessary for, act, for ITP to be fixed, and you can make recombinant FC multimers. 
Uh, we have currently available a sick kinase inhibitor, which is phosphomatib, which has a modest effect in ITP. And I'm going to finish this uh, overview by saying that we have interesting drugs which are in the pipeline, uh, which are based upon a new drug called Rilzabrutinib, which is one of the BTK inhibitors. So let's talk about BTK. This is a nifty pathway. BTK, you all know, plays a role in B-cell maturation. So here's a B-cell here. You're going to stimulate the B-cell. BTK is necessary for proliferation, differentiation, antibody production. And you all know if you give a patient with CLL abrutinib or any of you abrutinib, what happens is you destroy your B-cells, they undergo apoptosis and disappear. Well, BTK is also present on mast cells, basophils, and neutrophils. But we forget about, and we, I think we've forgotten about this for a number of years, these are, this is a critical pathway for macrophage activation. As I suggested, when you have an antigen-antibody complex, SICK gets activated, but you need BTK activation for phagocytosis, cytokine release, and degranulation. So BTK is a good target for my oncology colleagues who are talking in the other room right now for CLL, but for the immune doctors all everywhere, this is a very tempting target in terms of BTK inhibition for autoimmune diseases. So here's the BTK inhibitor you all know about, ibrutinib. In green here is BTK. It's got this lovely active site right here with a cysteine at residue 481. And what happens is ibrutinib binds to this covalently and just binds to it and never comes off. The net result of inhibiting BTK is that it uh, prevent proliferation of B cells. You have anti-inflammatory effects. You reduce antibody production. So these might all be salutary benefits of giving a patient a brutinib who's got some autoimmune condition. But the real problem is, is several. One is it binds to off-target thiols. Remember, thiols are SH residues on proteins. So what you want to do is think about other ways that you can maybe inhibit BTK without off-target effects. So there is a whole list of BTK inhibitors. Many of you, as you know, there's a brutinib, second-generation acalabrutinib, uh, Zanzibrutinib are also present here. And these are, are molecules that irreversibly bind uh, the, the cysteine 481. The second generation are a bit more targeted than the first generation. We also have non-covalent reversible BTK inhibitors that do this, and I'll, I'll describe what this means in a second. Then we have what are called covalent but reversible inhibitors, and that's this drug Rilzabrutinib I'll describe to you momentarily. So what does all this reversible nonsense mean if you want to have a cartoon and not be a, a, a protein chemist here? Well, a non-covalent inhibitor will bind with modest affinity to its target BTK and bind with little affinity to off-target residues, giving you a little off-target effect, but also minimal effect upon that molecule trying to inhibit. An irreversible molecule like a brutinib binds to the target BTK quite nicely and turns it off, but also binds to a whole load of other proteins over here, kinases, and gives you a lot of off-target effects. So when you want to make a drug specific and yet not going to target other molecules, you want a molecule that may be reversible. And what reversible means here is you target your active BTK, and it's got a modest off, what's called off rate here. It comes off a little bit. It binds a little bit to off-target effects, but it comes off the other molecules much faster. So this is all has to do with what are called off-rates. You bind the, the molecule to your target. If it comes off fast from your off-target, fine. If it comes off slowly from your target, you're doing well. So this is what a, a reversible BT inhibitor looks like. And so let's digress for a second and talk about CLL. We could move the other room for a few minutes, but basically 25% of CLL patients have an autoimmune cytopenia, warm antibody hemolysis, ITP, Peyronie's lyplasia. If you look at 301 patients described by the group in Ohio developing these drugs, uh, 78 out of, out of 300 patients had an autoimmune cytopenia before starting a brutinib. Of these 78, 22 were on treatment for their cytopenia, and what's interesting, 86% stop their therapy for their ITP and warm antibody hemolysis after a meeting of 4.7 months, meaning that this was a good therapy, at least in CLL patients, to treat the cytopenias. This is the data. This is a swimmer plot. This is, this is when ibrutinib started. Here's before ibrutinib. And what you see here is all these dots tend to disappear. And there are very few occurrences of cytopenias after you start the ibrutinib. And this has led people like us to think that a BTK inhibitor would be great in autoimmune diseases. But the problem with abrutinib is this. Its use in ITP is anecdotal. I've used it a number of times with success. There's no data in patients without lymphoproliferative diseases. 
There's a lot of off-target binding, such as atrial arrhythmias. There is an increased risk of bleeding because it inhibits platelet function. So this is not the greatest of drugs to use in ITP patients. So rilzobrutinib is a new molecule developed that is designed for immune diseases. It binds to BTK shown here. It doesn't bind to other things. And if it does bind, it comes off very fast. If you give it to, to healthy humans or non-healthy humans with ITP, uh, it is present for a very short period of time in a circulation, but it inhibits BTK for a whole 24 hours. So this is a nice pharmacologic profile. Now going to one of the questions that you ask, and here's the, here's the cheater point here. <clears throat> Abrutinib has a modest effect on plated aggregation. It doesn't affect ADP or, or other uh, activators, but if it does inhibit collagen-based activation so it, it moderately affects platelet function. Rilzobrutinib does not have any platelet inhibitory effects, and this is why it's a good drug for ITP. It also doesn't seem to have any off-target effects in terms of atrial arrhythmias. If you say, well, gee, what's the preclinical data that this is even going to work? Well, studies were done with this molecule a while ago. This is a mouse with a normal platelet count. We can create ITP in a mouse and have the platelet count drop. We can treat the mouse with IVIG and the platelet count rises. And if we treat them with different doses of rilzobrutinib, we can also have the platelet count rise. This suggests in animal models, we can raise the platelet count. So what happens in humans? And this is a study we published last year. These are my many authors around the world who contributed to the study. And we studied rilzobrutinib in ITP in a, a phase one slash two study. The study design is shown here. This is a small study of 60 patients. We tested some lower doses initially, but the vast majority of patients got 400 milligrams twice a day, which turns out to be the clinically relevant dose. And then they were treated for a total of 24 weeks. At the end of 24 weeks, a total of 16 patients were eligible to go on to a long-term study with this drug. And what I'm gonna show to you is the data for the initial 24 weeks, then show you data for the extension study that's going on now for almost three and a half years. Patient characteristics, the patients were middle-aged, a little bit more women than men. They had a median platelet count of 15,000. And what's interesting is they had a duration of ITP for a median of six years, and they had also failed a median of four prior therapies. So these are pretty bad ITP patients that we scrounged up from around the world. If you ask in a phase uh, one or two study, what's, what's the goal? The goal is to look at adverse events. And if I just encourage you to look at the events we had very few adverse events, diarrhea, nausea, and fatigue, which happen a lot in ITP patients. Grade one and two events were actually incredibly low, total of 25% here, and the types of events were down here. So this drug was well tolerated by patients, and no one had to stop the drug because of adverse events. So if you want to ask, did this thing work? And the answer is, if we just focus on the, the higher dose, and I'm going to not spend much time on lower doses, except to say that if you look at the patients, 40% of patients responded. And the response was a platelet count going from below 30,000 to over 50,000 on two consecutive measurements. And I'll describe that in more detail in a second. And what we found is that the, the dose that was great was uh, twice a day at 400 milligrams, gave us an almost 40% response rate in the study. Here is where the other endpoints were, were more impressive to us. And that is, if you look at in a 24-week study, if you look at what percentage of patients had a platelet count over 50,000 for that entire time, 67% of the time these patients had a platelet count over 50,000. So the, the duration of effect was rather long. If you ask uh, what, pa what was the median number of, of weeks that patients had a platelet count over 20,000, it was a median of 14 out of 24. What about a platelet count over 30,000? Uh, a median of 21 out of 24 weeks, the platelet count was in that range. And lastly, this drug tended to work very fast. The onset of effect was at day 12. So this is a drug, as I'll show you here next, the response in the responders was quite robust and rapid. Within two weeks, the majority of patients responded to this medication, probably because we're turning off the macrophages that are turning, turning off the, the platelet destruction. The non-responders are shown down here. The responders are shown here, and the median rise in platelet count over the, over the non-responders was about a median of 68,000. So these patients hung out at a platelet count of 75 to 100,000. This is not the high platelet counts you see with a TPRA, but these are all patients who successfully got their platelet count over 50,000.
And the real question is, did they stay there? And I'll show you that data in a second. Responders varied a huge amount. It didn't matter whether the responders had, had a prior splenectomy, whether they had a chronic or, or less duration of ITP. The drug by itself gave a 45% response rate. Patients could also be on a TPRA, and those patients did well. So prior therapy did not predicate who responded or didn't respond to this drug. And finally, and this is, I think, the most important point, here are the, the patients who didn't respond. Here's our initial 24-week response criteria. They responded rather rapidly, and by the uh, 24 weeks, we had a nice, re, a nice high platelet count. And over the next three years, and this has been carried out now to 1,700 days, we have a very nice response rate in these patients. Uh, the duration of response, as you look at platelet counts over 30,000, this occurred a median of 95% of the weeks on study. A platelet count over 50,000 was present on a median of 72% of the weeks on study. So these responses were rapid, and they were maintained for a long time. Finally, there is a phase three study being done with this drug that uh, many of you may know about. We're looking at adults and kids. We're going to randomize them to 400 milligrams uh, twice a day or standard of care, and we'll follow them for 24 weeks to prove this drug has the high response rate that we showed you a few minutes ago. So to summarize then, this is a short list of a huge number of new products being developed in autoimmune diseases, particularly ITP. They range from, from variations of IVIG to rules of rutinum. This is a very interesting era to be an ITP researcher and also autoimmune disorder researcher, and a lot of new drugs are coming our way to treat this condition. And that, I think I'll stop and give my voice a rest. We had a question that came in just about kind of the clinical profile of the patients, kind of combining some questions together. One was about um, the fatigue, and this was specifically a question for you regarding the fatigue and why do we think that's the case. And then the other was just do the patients that we presented represent really how patients come to us? And I think it really does. A lot of patients, the focus of the visit is on the fatigue and on the quality of life or on the side effects of, of prolonged steroid um, dosing. So I'll let you address the question about the yeah, I think etiology the, of fatigue. Uh, yeah, I, I once was asked of a lecture for an hour on fatigue and I finished in 12 minutes. But I think the real problem with fatigue is we, you know, the joke is that patient says I'm fatigued and you respond, well, how fatigued are you? Well, I'm fatigued. And then I say, well, I'm as fatigued as you are. If we did a, did a fatigue score, my fatigue score is probably the same as yours. And that's, that's sort of disrespectful of patients' fatigue. And I simply say that doctors are fatigued and everyone's fatigued. ITP fatigue is quite different. It is profound. It can be uh, not treatable. Yes, some of these patients have ongoing depression or other uh, mental disorders that need to be looked at. But it's something we need to take care of. Why it happens, I think there have been many discussions whether the serotonin, which is present in a lot of platelets, is necessary for the brain. I think that's a little bit uh, dicey. There's also data that says fatigue may be related to cognitive dysfunction. There are some, there's data looking at microinfarcts in brains of some, of some young patients. Again, this is all speculative data, so I don't think we know. But what, what I will say is cognitive function is really low in ITP yeah. patients. It, it, it rivals po chemotherapy brain. It's actually quite yeah. striking. Yeah, yeah. There were a couple <clears throat> abstracts at yeah. ASH regarding cognitive function, if anybody's interested in looking back on those. Um, so let me ask you a question, because I yeah. think I got here. So how do you treat patients refractory to steroids, immunoglobulins, <laughs> rituximab, and TPRA, okay? I, I knew yeah. you were going to say yeah, I know. that I, 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 would, I didn't, want to didn't want to take that myself, okay? <laughs> You know, this notion of the refractory patients, you know, it, it's, it's a term we throw around. We, we don't really have a good, we kind of all know the patient we're talking about without having a really well-defined population. These are the patients that I start to think about the role of an agent. I do try MMF. Um, there's some data with um, using sirolimus, and I've had some success with sirolimus in, in patients that have failed a lot of our other pathways. I think it kind of gets at a different mechanism. There was a paper, nice paper out of um, CHOP by David Tichy looking, and that was in the setting of a lot of Evans syndrome, but there were some patients with ITP in there. Um, and then also combination therapy, this notion of kind of a low dose of steroids with a TPO. Um, I had a patient that did not respond to TPOs. I gave her rituximab. She didn't respond to rituximab. I put her back on the TPO and it worked. So there is this role of combination therapy that I don't think we've quite teased out yet. But um, 
I think but, I, would, you know, I would probably preface that know. the answer by also saying that a patient who's this refractory, oh, yeah. <laughs> that I would probably reassess the diagnosis, number yes. one. Yes, and that was another and, question and, and, in here, oh, too, and about the, at yeah. what point do you reassess? And, and I think at every stage, you should be absolutely looking back. We send primary immune deficiency panels. We look for congenital thrombocytopenias. I always love when the adults get to tell us that they picked up somebody at the age of 50 who had a congenital thrombocytopenia that was just told they had ITP. So, yeah, very good point. Yeah, and I think right now it's, it's important to reevaluate these patients who are frustrating just to make sure you're not m missing a diagnosis. And the other question comes up, if someone's over 65, do you automatically do a bone marrow biopsy? I think my response is no, but certainly if they have refractory therapy, my concern obviously is for myelodysplastic syndrome. I do have one question here that was handed to me. Someone with very nice handwriting, by the way, <laughs> says, how would you treat a patient with ITP, platelet counts of 20,000, who has an acute DVT? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This has come up. Uh, there's a couple of questions <laughs> in here as well regarding thrombotic risk and how to manage thrombotic risk in ITP. I mean, I, these are patients I do avoid uh, TPOs in. I, I do think that that for me is a population that makes me nervous anyway right. with regards to that. And then I typically try to get the threshold. In my mind, I actually, you know, we target around 30,000 for most patients with an anticoagulant if we need to use one. Um, yeah, I, I, have, I have patients at 5,000 on both Plavix, aspirin, and warfarin, so yeah. I think you know, they haven't bled, so I'm, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. <laughs> but, but I think in general, we tend to to, to want to recognize that if you're above 20 or 30,000, it's probably okay for one anticoagulant drug, and two may be a bit dicey, so I would probably say 50 is an arbitrary number to think about. I'd also add if what, what one version of this question that comes up a lot, you have an adult patient who's got a plate account of 20,000, has ITP doing fine, all of a sudden it's a heart attack. And the cardiologists say we can't give them aspirin. So what would you guys do? I, w I say it rhetorically because I think right now that patient should get twice as much aspirin as someone else because those platelets are very functional. You want to turn them off. And you, they have a half-life of six to eight hours. You want to give them a second dose of aspirin four to six hours later. So I think right now you've got to be careful ITB patients being undertreated by our cardiology friends. I think as long as they're not hemorrhaging it to death, which they rarely do, I think an anti uh, uh, aspirin will be important. So let me just, uh, there's another question that I think it probably is addressed to me. Is there a reason to prefer reversible BTK to second generation co co uh, covalent BTK? I think the answer is for autoimmune diseases, there may be an advantage of that less art off target effects. I'm certainly not going to talk about CLL. So I think right now I, I don't have a comment. I think our focus is simply on autoimmune therapy. And the reason why reversal BTKs may be helpful in autoimmune disease is you might have these patients on these agents for years if they work as efficiently as they might possibly work. Again, more studies are needed. Someone asked about, can you switch between TPRAs if you're intolerant? Uh, the answer is, yeah, that works real well. If you have intolerance or uh, financial instability from one, you can switch to a different one. So I think that the switching is quite easily done for many patients effectively. How about any biomarkers to diagnose uh, ITP or predictors hmm. to response? That, that is a hot field right now. There's a lot of biobanks out there um, trying to really make these associations. One, the predictive risk of sort of chronicity, particularly in the pediatric population. Who is it that's going to become chronic? And then can we do anything about it once we identify that risk? And then the response to treatment really gets at this difference in biology of disease between patients. And you can see from just even impaired megakaryocyte data, you know, not no two patients are the same. Um, so we likely have different drivers and different patients will respond to different therapies. It'd be nice. A lot of patients do get drug fatigue from feeling as though they just keep trying different drugs and switching. And it would be really nice to know this is your profile and this is what we're going to give you. But we don't have that yet. So do you do anti plate antibody testing? I do not. Okay, all right. I, I do not. I mean, mm. there's an occasional patient where I really am kind of struggling, but then I oft oftentimes I send it and then I get it back and I feel maybe yeah, as confused. Uh, usually, by time it <laughs> usually by the time it comes back, it, 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 it's too late. So I'm, Sometimes it makes yeah. me more confused. And, yeah, so. unlike, unlike a lot of oncology topics, for, you know, for example, the, the, the uh, thrombocytic penis are genetically determined, a lot of gene mutations that can affect that. I think right now for ITP, we don't have a good gene profile yet of who's got immunocompromised state or is susceptible to having these conditions. So I think it's, yeah. it's a, 
something that's going to happen in the next 10 years? I mean, I do think looking for secondary causes is the one thing that can guide our therapies. Yeah. And and we have sent off primary immune deficiency panels and you find a gene for CVID mm. and then you start working with the immunology colleagues or a pathway perhaps that would be a signal. Mm. Um, so we're getting there. I think we there's mm. a lot of focus on this, but, yeah. but it, we don't have precision medicine yet for ITP. Certainly would be nice. We're better than they were in 1808. <laughs> okay. So let me just uh, stop by saying that uh, thank you all for coming. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash dbx865. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi.